Welcome to the Animation Industry Podcast. My name is Terry, and I hate fish. Not as a food, just as animals. I just hate them. They're just big swimming mouths. Today I'm chatting with Musay Brooker, who has spent a good portion of his career working in stop motion, where he first started as an animator, then worked his way up to lead, then supervisor, and then director. And currently, he's the creative director at Six Point Harness, an animation studio which produced the Academy Award-winning short Hair Love, HBO's Backstories, and Adult Swim's Laser Wolf, among others. Now, in this chat, Musay is going to share how he got into animation, worked his way up, and where he's heading now. So without further ado, let's jump in. Hi, Musay. Thanks for coming on the podcast. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. It's still day here in, in LA, but yeah. Right. We, got a, we got a time difference. Uh, it's right. uh, evening here and it's day for you. So how are you doing regardless? I'm good. It's a little bit warm uh, here in LA. So I got my air conditioner on. Uh, hopefully the noise isn't, uh, isn't in the audio for you, but um, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I don't hear it at all. And it's quite chilly here in Toronto, so I can't wait for the... <laughs> the warm weather to, to come this way. So yeah, I was, uh, I was on your website and I saw that you are allergic to some cats, but you have some cats. So I am indeed. Can I, you, uh, can you explain that situation? Yeah. Yeah. Putting yourself I, in danger every day. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I, uh, am in love with a lady that has some cats. So, <laughs> so, uh, you know, um, they became my cats and, uh, I love them dearly. So I, you know, it's, um, I, I am allergic, but sort of have built up a tolerance to them. I can't, you know, rub them in my face per se, but, um, uh, you know, I can pet them and play with them. And then, then I have to de-louse, have to de wash my hands right. um, before I touch my face. But other than that, um, they're cats and my pets just like normal. Nice. Um, I mean, I, I don't usually picture people rubbing a cat in, in their face. So, <laughs> That's true. Not very common. Yeah. Uh, Barnaby Jones and uh, Dexter Dew are their names. Well, this is a perfect segue. It's not a segue at all into animation. Let's talk mm. about it. Let's talk about animation. So you're at Six Point Harness now. I, I know you're kind of new there since September. Um, congratulations on being creative director. And uh, you've got Thanks some exciting so projects going on right now. You know, Waffles and Mochi. I don't know if you want to talk to that or you know, how you came on as creative director, but let's chat all about it. So maybe you can sure. me on, you know, how you came to Six Point and uh, some of the projects you're working on. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I've been there, uh, it'll be two years in September. Um, I got a random call. Uh, uh, you know, let me back up a little bit. I, so a lot of my career has been in stop motion and was working in stop motion got a random call um, from the folks at Higher Grounds. Um, and they had a project, uh, that project turned out to be Waffles and Mochi. I didn't know anything about it. Didn't even know they were doing animation per se. Um, started talking to them about that and um, completely separately, um, uh, the folks at Six Point called me up to interview me for a completely different job. Um, and I, I had actually taken a flash class, uh, at six point when I was uh, a student at CalArts, a grad student at CalArts. So I knew the studio, but, uh, the head of production was someone that I had worked with before, Barb Simity, and, um, I guess recommended me for, as a director on a job, um, completely separate job from Waffles and Mochi. Um, they landed the project of Waffles and Mochi, the animation for Waffles and Mochi at Six Point Harness. And when both companies realized I was sort of on uh, each other's lists as a potential director, they decided to, to, to go with me. They agreed on me and, and uh, brought me in. That's fantastic. Yeah, how, yeah. How, okay, so you said you got two random calls, I guess, from different companies. How frequent does that happen? Or does that happen when you get to a certain level of of your career where you're starting to be recommended yeah i think it i think it happens um it it certainly happened to me throughout my career more recently not recently since i've been at six point but before that as a freelance artist i wasn't necessarily tied to a particular studio so um sometimes uh often there would be jobs that would overlap or jobs that would happen back to back 
at totally different studios. So it just, just depended on the situation and the circumstance. Um, in this particular case, it just happened to be around the same time um, that the two projects started to happen. Um, and I ended up uh, working on one of them. So did you have to quit a current project you were working on or, or did it just work out? It, it kind of worked out. Yeah, I was finished on a project and um, had a little bit of time off in between, but but knew as I was leaving the one, the previous project that I would be starting Waffles and Mochi relatively soon. So it was it was actually nice because, you know, uh, uh, work can be pretty intense. And so it's it, it, it can be nice to have a little bit of downtime knowing you've got work coming up. Yeah, for sure. Um, so you've been creative director for, uh, I guess, a year, a year and a half ish, almost two years, I guess. Well, actually, going back a little bit, I so I joined the studio just as the director for the animation on Waffles and Mochi. Gotcha. And um, uh, worked on that project. Um, the folks at Higher Ground were happy. Uh, Netflix was happy, and Six Point was happy with the work I was doing, and. Um, uh, Brendan and the folks at Six Point um, asked me to come on board full time uh, as that project was winding down and become um, a creative director at Six Point. So I actually started, it'll be a year in July that I officially started as creative director rather than just an individual director on a project. Nice. So what is what is the biggest difference in your day to day of being a director versus or creative director versus director then? Um, a lot, actually. Uh, in theory, it's it's somewhat similar, but um, you know, when you're a director on a particular project, you are the the chief creative or the lead um, with regards to that single project. As a creative director of the studio, I um, have input on a great deal of the creative throughout all projects or most projects that the studio works on. Um, so I'm part of the creative. A leadership of the studio, essentially. So um, uh, the studio since its inception has had a, a founding creative director, uh, Greg, uh, Greg Franco. And um, uh, there we had a lot of projects at the studio and he was busy directing a big project and they thought it was the right time to bring in someone else um, as a creative director to help with the creative leadership. and. Um, I happened to be at the right place at the right time, and they they thought I'd be a good choice for that. So together with um, with Brendan, uh, uh, the CEO of the studio, and uh, Wendy Willis, uh, the head of uh, development, we're sort of uh, the creative leads uh, of the studio, and really check in on just about every project um, between the the four of us. Every project that the studio is working on. So how do you? So you're. You're overseeing, I guess, every project versus one specific project, which a director would would oversee. Are you is, is are you doing a lot of research into like styles and um, I don't know cinematography to figure out the look and feel of each show, and then you're working with the director to to like get that going? For sure, yeah. It depends. Every project's a little bit different, uh, but it it sort of depends. Um, so you know, part of my role is. Um, Absolutely, supervising other directors on projects. Uh, also directing, I direct some things myself. Um, uh, work again with Wendy, the head of development uh, on projects that we uh, are working on internally that we're hoping to take out and pitch. Um, also when clients come in and want us to um, uh, execute on a project, um, I'm often part of that process and helping to develop the look and style uh, launching artists, um, working with uh, designers, storyboard artists, doing research myself, uh, making mood boards. Um, part of it is, um, you know, always being on the lookout for trends and styles and different things that that we can do as a studio. You know, one of the things that that we're really proud of at the studio is that um, we don't really have a house style. We we sort of tailor. Uh, every project has its own tailored style. And so, you know, every project has a little bit of visual development time and figuring out and finding, you know, what are our references? Where do we want to pull things from? What kind of styles, what kind of artists do we have in house that would be a good fit? What uh, artists 
uh, freelancers can we pull from or designers can we hire on to, to help flesh out our team? Um, so it's, it's sort of all of that is, you know, is part of being a creative director, really, you know, um, helping to find that talent, nurturing that talent that's, that's in the studio, some of the younger talent and helping them sort of find their calling or the things that they really like to do. Um, on the hunt for for new talent, meeting with um, potential clients or potential artists to hire. Um, and so all of those things are part of being a creative director, which again is, um, it, it incorporates what it means to be a director, but it's also uh, a whole lot more. Gotcha. So like, <clears throat> I guess a successful creative director would be somebody who has a lot of experience managing projects kind of successfully and working with individual artists and and teams to like execute that and also somebody who has you know a strong vision and and uh artistic voice i guess too um <clears throat> I'm, does that, hopefully does that make sense <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely absolutely so I'm, I'm, yeah. i don't know if you can use maybe waffles and, and mochi as an example but i'm wondering like as you're developing a style of a show from scratch other than you know making a consistent look and feel uh, based, I, I guess you work with the creators and the and the network or Netflix or whatnot to create the style. What makes it successful? Are you looking to create something that feels a certain way, or you said you were looking into trends that resonates with a certain audience? Like, are you doing kind of test focus groups throughout the way, and like how do you how do you develop a style that you know is going to be success? for what like what are the what are the criteria and how sure. do you measure it i guess sure sure i mean some of that a lot of that frankly is is gut and sort of yeah. you know uh, knowing what i think works part of that is sort of seeing what's in the marketplace and what is um what's out there what people are responding to um part of that is um you know uh, understanding what the creators of the show and the production the producers of the show what they want to get out of it. Um, and that was a big part of Waffles and Moshi was, um, you know, I was directing the animation, but, you know, I was uh, working under the supervision of the director of the show, um, Jeremy Connor, and, um, and the show's co-creators and the producers, uh, Erica and Jeremy. Um, uh, and uh, all the folks at Higher Ground and folks at, at Netflix and, and trying to, you know, pick their brains and understand the things that they were looking to have in the show, um, references that they pulled. Um, they had their own mood boards, their own sort of references and things that they liked. Yeah. Um, you know, I also brought things to the table that I enjoy and references that I like and things from animation history uh, styles that, that I think are really great and can be used in different ways, as well as just bringing my own personal artistic sense, um, leaning into, you know, the style that um, individual designers bring. Um, and it's sort of, it's all, it's, it's sort of pulling from a lot of different sources to, um, you know, to, to develop a style that's unique to the show, but, but maybe uh, highlight certain things or certain cultural influences or certain historical styles. Um, one of the things that, that uh, the show creators were really keen on was to um, have a variety of different styles within the show and almost making it feel like different animators, different teams were working on different styles because part of what the show was doing was going out to different countries, tasting different foods, different flavors, different recipes. And so we had a similar approach to the animation. We wanted it to feel like a kind of like a smorgasbord of um, styles and animation and, and, and different takes. So that was that was pretty purposeful. That's pretty interesting. So uh, I'm, you mentioned, you know, you you get a gut feeling and you're trying to filter through all these different uh, mood boards and influences that everybody's bringing to the table. How do you, you know, put all that information together and have the confidence to say, this is the creative vision and when somebody challenges it, you say like, maybe a producer comes and says like, oh, what about this? I really like this. How do you, uh, in a nice way, I guess, maybe sure. this is the wrong word, but like shut that down and, and like keep on this one path that has your gut attached to it when that's, yeah. that's like, like there's no right or wrong answer, I guess. 
For sure. Yeah. There's, it, it's not necessarily shutting it down for sure, but right. it's, that, that you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's more, um, I'm sorry. I need to turn off my notifications here. <laughs> Apologize for that. Should That's right. Before we got started. Um, it's, it's more, you know, it's less um, shutting things down and more sort of um, part of the challenge, of course, when you're dealing in, you know, with creative things and you're creating something from scratch is, you know, getting the ideas out of somebody else's head, you know, as well as getting the ideas out of your head and being able to communicate the ideas, the vision and the, the, the way that you see the project happening um, and sort of filtering those things together, however many people are contributing to the creative process and sort of that's the recipe, mixing a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And, and you know, part of my role on Waffles and Mochi was that I, um, they, the producers, the show creators, uh, they didn't, they had some ideas and some references, but they weren't animation people. You know, they didn't, they weren't steeped in that world. And so part of my job was, to educate them yeah. uh, over the, uh, you know, over the, the course, you know, they're very capable, they're, they're brilliant writers and uh, artists and, and, and showrunners in their own uh, sake, you know, for their own sake, but they weren't animation people. And so it was, it was trying to find the right references to understand what they wanted and how they wanted to communicate things, bringing some things that I thought would be important to, flesh out those ideas and enhance those ideas um and then sort of putting it all together pitching them on something they'd pitch me ideas back it, it was a conversation it wasn't you know you got to do it this way or me saying you know well it has to be this way or it, it can't happen it was it it was a conversation it was a collaboration and you know part of that collaboration was um knowing when to say um you feel strongly about this let's go with what you know, I don't want to. I don't want to continue to push back if this is something you feel strongly about. And I think there was the same thing on their side. If they saw, you know, the merit of an idea or a concept or a style, um, they kind of let me run with it. So that's awesome. I, I shouldn't um, say me. They let the team. You know, it's. It, I certainly did not make the animation for this this show alone. You know, it's a a large group of of really talented uh, artists. Yeah, as you're talking, I'm just kind of thinking about your journey because you know you've 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 been an animator and a lead and a supervisor and and a producer director. And it seems like it seems like all of your experiences culminating into this into this role. Is it? Uh, would you say that you know this is kind of where your expertise lies in this area? Or, um... I mean, I I definitely think it it is a you know a culmination of all the different things I've done over the course of my career for sure. Yeah. I I didn't it's sort of like a dream job. I didn't know that I wanted, <laughs> you know, if that makes sense, you know, like I, and, and I should say that creative director is different at different studios, different projects. It really depends on, uh, on the, on the company that you're working at. But, um, you know, at six point, at least for me and my experience, it really is the culmination of, um, all these different facets of things that I've done over the course of my time in animation and, and sort of, now getting to do all of them more or less at the same time it, it, it's even combining you know aspects of my teaching career and and sort of you know guiding talent and nurturing talent and and frankly learning from talent you know it's um i think a lot of times people think the um the 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 role of a teacher you know that information only flows one way and and I think if you're doing it right, it absolutely flows both ways. And the same thing I think is true of being a director and, and being, uh, by extension, being a creative director. I've learned so much from the people that I've worked with as much, uh, hopefully, as people have taken from me, you know. Okay. Um, and, and I think that's, that's an important aspect of it as well. So what is something really big that you learned uh, from this role recently or since, since it started? 
I should have seen that question. Putting you on the spot. <laughs> um, let me think. You, um, are, you asked this question yourself. I basically. did. I did. What was I thinking? Um, I, you know, I think, I think by extension, it's something that I was beginning to learn or felt like I've learned as a director and, and now even more so as a, as a creative director. It's really, it is, um, being passionate, being um, communicative, um, being forceful if need be to get what's in your head out onto the screen, but also knowing when to let go mm. and when to um, lean away from your idea because someone else has brought a better idea and not be wrapped up in the ego of your idea or um, or knowing that there are limitations to your schedule or to your budget or, or, or perhaps, you know, to your own ability to communicate something. And rather than getting stuck in a melee or a, a tug of a creative tug of war, um, you know, sort of letting go and leaning into what's in front of you and, and making the best version of that, that you can, uh, given the circumstances. Um, oh, yeah. You know, and I think that that's, I think that's an ongoing learning thing because I think, you know, part of what it means to be a good director or a good creative director is really almost laser focus on a vision that you have and, and, and finding a way to make that thing and to get that thing out into the world. Um, but I, I, it's, it seems to me at this point, it's equal parts um knowing that you'll never get what's exactly in your head out and everybody that works on the project if they're doing their job right is going to plus the project and bring something unique that they bring to it and and enhance the project in, in their unique way and that you have to be open to that exchange and that um because otherwise you're gonna you'll drive yourself crazy and you'll drive your crew crazy right. you know like just holding on you'll you know. micromanage and absolutely nobody, nobody absolutely. likes that yeah absolutely did you did did you know that's a tough lesson to learn did you do you can you remember a time when you know you had to learn that lesson <laughs> because i mean it's it's every day <laughs> it's every day <laughs> it's every day just in, just in that you know i'm i you know i wanted to work in animation size five so i'm really passionate about it yeah and and um you know i'll fight for to make the best version of the project that I can. Um, and part of that fight is sometimes like being tenacious about an idea or pushing artists a little bit further, even outside of their comfort zone. Um, but I think for me, what is um, when it when it works, when I'm able to, even if I don't get what's in my head, as long as I've I've tried my best to get the best version of what I think that project will be, even if it's not what was in my head or it's even radically different, I once it's done, I'm satisfied. And I feel like, you know, I'll take whatever lessons I learned and apply them to the next project and not I I try not to, you know, play the what ifs or ruminate on what wasn't done properly knowing that i have the chance on the next project to improve on whatever oh, yeah. we did as a team or i did as a as a as a leader or whatever that's definitely a thing i mean i have personal projects that <clears throat> they've just been developing for like 15 years because it, i never <laughs> there's no deadline and so i can just be a perfectionist forever versus the stuff that i've created that has deadlines and i'm able to move on and work on the next thing with what i learned um you mentioned um you know pushing artists even if it's out of their comfort zone how how do you do that in a way that encourages them to uh, do get them out of their comfort zone versus discourage them? Because I feel like there's a fine line there and I'm just interested in how the best way to do that is. I think some of it is, is um, recognizing or like, learning to, go ahead, I'm sorry. So I was, I was gonna do maybe let's do a little role play. You know, I'm an I'm an artist, and uh, you, I did a shot or something, and it's uh, you know it could be pushed further. What would you say to me? Like, because you know, there's the concept of like the shit sandwich, and, and sure. 
formula, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? So I, how would you, I'd how would usually you start off by saying wrong, do it again, and then I'd walk away. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think part of what I, how I understand it is what I look for when I get feedback and everybody responds a little bit differently. And part of, part of what I've learned from teaching is knowing that there are some sort of standards, but that everybody perceives things a little bit differently. And sometimes you have to take special attention to the way that somebody is working or the, the skills that they have or um, uh, different level of patience or knowing that people come to the table with different levels of experience um, and different skill sets, right? And sort of part of it really is in the same way that part of being a good, good animator is observing, part of being a good teacher, part of being a good supervisor is observing and seeing what people do well and seeing what people maybe could work on and, and knowing that um, there, are, there are ways to encourage the things that they are good at um, and there's a way to um to let them know that they there are areas that they could improve without you know i'm a big fan of positive reinforcement and so um when i give critique both to to professionals as well as to students that i work with it it really is taking the time to assess what they've done to really look at it to see what's working well um i think and I guess this is the shit sandwich that you're that you're talking about, but I, I, you know, I do think there is a method to not saying this is terrible right off the bat because people shut down, right? And so, and letting people know, here's what's working. This is successful, but here's what needs to be pushed or challenged. Or sometimes it's letting them know that there are other ways to think about or to approach a problem or an idea. Um, I think a lot of times artists are very concrete in terms of like, you need a thing, tell me what the thing is and I'll give you the thing. Um, and different artists work differently, but sometimes they need, they need references or they need draw overs or they need um, take a look at this or you know this is how I solve this problem. And just opening opening the avenues that they have to think about a problem, right? Because, you know, that's, that's what filmmaking is every day is problem solving, right? It's, it's, and whether that problem is how to communicate what this character is feeling in this moment or how to best, you know, um, I don't know, uh, 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 design uh, a moment, a storytelling moment right it's 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 you're solving the problems you know how do you how do you make a you know an insect character more appealing you know whatever whatever that problem is right it's it's problem solving and and sometimes whether that's design whether that's storyboarding whether that's color styling um sometimes it's just opening the idea of how they're approaching or thinking about something that could be the spark um, sometimes it is like, ah, I think you need to do this, <laughs> but a lot of times it is, you know, um, have you thought about this aspect of it? Yeah. Um, uh, I kind of lost my train of thought there, but hopefully no, no. I answered your question. <laughs> totally, totally makes sense. Like <clears throat> sometimes when I'm in a shot, I get so in my head about the action that I'm trying to do that I don't see the bigger picture or I don't Absolutely. even consider something else. And then if, you know, somebody comes to me and says, Hey, you know, this didn't, work as effectively why not try this uh you know i feel a little defensive first of all but of it, if it's explained to me i totally get it and, and it's like you know what you're you're right that would that would work what you were saying about you know everybody has different uh strengths and different ways that they need communicating to so a lot of it is just kind of observation makes sense um i want to talk a little bit about you because i feel like we haven't even though we're talking about your roles you know you mentioned something you <laughs> You've been thinking about being an animator since you were five. I think when I was five, I was like looking for caterpillars under rocks and stuff outside. Where I mean, I was doing that too, but <laughs> thinking of animating those caterpillars um, in stop motion specifically. So you, you know, you live and breathe animation. You teach, you work, etc. Uh, where does this never-ending fountain of passion come from, and how do you 
you know, you also mentioned previously that you learned that you need to be passionate about a project for it to be successful. Where do you get this and, and how do you keep filling it over the years? Um, that is a good question. <laughs> um, I, I don't know where it comes from. It's That's kind fine. of just there, <laughs> you know, like I, I, um, it's just the only thing that I've ever wanted to do with any seriousness. Um, yeah. the, the only other thing I remember wanting to do was like, like a lot of, you know, whatever, four, three, four, five year olds was be a fireman because that seemed cool. Right. Um, but other than that, uh, I've wanted to work in, in cartoons and animation and comics um, in some form. And so um, just have been, I just fell in love with it. I, you know, at an early age, I fell in love with Disney and Warner Brothers and MGM cartoons and Hanna Barbera, and um, it just spoke to me. And and as I grew older, I under I began to learn and understand the 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 depth of the medium and the diversity of the medium, and fell equally in love with you know experimental and abstract animation like Lin Lai or Oscar Fischinger or um you know Caroline Leaf or you know Norman McLaren or what you know um uh and so just followed that passion and um I I don't I I don't know any other thing you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I don't know any other way. Um, you know, I'm sure my parents played a role. My father is a painter and a professor. And so art, you know, I took art classes at a young age and art was always part of my life uh, because it was part of his life. And, and my stepmother um, was an executive at the Philadelphia Art Museum. And so art was just always around. And as well as teaching, both my parents taught. My, my mother is a school teacher. So that side of my passion was always there right um but you uh, must you must so that i think for me there's like two parts to it you know you love the work but also you must love the process too to to stay in it or do you get fulfillment from uh you know completing a project like you said earlier or is it more the day-to-day -day grind of of creating this stuff i mean it's it's kind of both you know i i um What's fun for me right now is that it is I'm I'm I have more direct input on how a project comes together, uh, and that's really exciting. I, I I I'm writing as well, and and so that's another. You know, I've always had ideas, but the idea that I would be a writer um, seemed like oh no, I I'm an artist, you know. Um, but it's all part of the creative process. I feel like, and and one of the wonderful things about animation is the is the diversity of the medium, is the, how many other art forms plug into it. There's writing, there's designing, there's painting, there's sculpting, there's music, you know, um, and it all feeds into animation. And so um, that's part of continuing to be excited, growing into new roles and seeing how different roles play into projects and, um, being a part of a project in a different way you know being an animator is very different than being a director um and so i've been fortunate enough that i've been able to continue to grow into different roles and so that keeps it new and fresh and exciting yeah um yeah is there is there um something on that path that you're trying to work towards is there an end goal in sight I don't know if there's an end goal, but you know, um, you know, I've, I've been, we've been taking some ideas out and pitching, and and that's really exciting, um, yeah. just to explore, you know, worlds as a creator um, and as a scriptwriter, and and working with artists to flesh out that idea um, is really exciting. And I've I've been fortunate enough to be in the writers' room on a few different projects. Um, and actually, you know, uh, my time at Waffles and Mochi actually began in the writer's room. I wasn't a writer on the project, but 
when I was hired as the an, uh, director of animation or animation director, whatever, um, as the supervisor of the animation, um, they were at the tail end of the writing room. So they had ideas and concepts and they wanted someone who, they wanted the animation person on the show to be a part of that process and part of that discussion that early. Um, and so that was great. I've also been in the writer's room on a more recent project that uh, Six Point is working on and contributing in that way as the creative director, not as a writer proper, but, um, but you know, certainly I have a, a, a few different writing partners for different collaborators and the idea of seeing a world that I've written and created from scratch with creative partners and sort of seeing that come into fruition is and it's something that I'm really excited about. That but, is really exciting. So you're yeah. currently you're currently exploring that, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. I um, I've had uh, a, a a main writing partner for a few years, and I'm also collaborating with a few other a couple of other writing partners um, on different projects. And um, when I um, you know I brought my uh, one of my ideas to uh, Wendy, who's the head of development at Six Point, and and she liked it, and and so then we um, we we have been, and we continue to work on developing that idea and taking it out. So, so what is? I'm I'm just curious because like, you know, you're creative director. You've got a ton of experience, connections. You know, you've refined that artistic voice. You've got all the ex, you know, you went from animator, etc. Um, you're looking at trends, and you're developing your own stuff and writing it. Like, what is what is the next? Like, what's preventing you from just you know? working on something now, launching it, and now you're working on essentially that thing that you would love to be doing. Obviously there are stages that things need to go through. Yeah, but... yeah, I, I mean, I think that's it. Just just um, trusting the process and being part yeah. of that process. And, and um, you know, I, I do have a little bit of a creative restlessness in that I have lots of ideas. And so, so um, you know, being able to make sure that ideas are fully formed and take the right shape before they're going out is, yeah. is part of that process. But, but also because, you know, I, I, there are so many things that are going on at the studio. Um, it's a mix of, you know, work for hire that we do as a service studio, as well as developing our own projects or working with creative collaborators to develop projects uh, with them and then take those out and sell those to, to yeah, that's the so. that's the catch-22 that every studio faces absolutely you, you absolutely. get into business because you want to make your own stuff but you got to make other people's stuff to stay in absolutely. business <laughs> and you know it's funny because i one of my students i think asked me what the difference was between you know projects that you that come from you and projects that come from others that you do and i think I don't have kids, um, and so I don't don't really know <laughs> what that's cats. like. But I do have cats. I have fur babies, <laughs> and so. Um, but it's to me, it feels like um, w when you have a child, a birth child, and then when you have an adopted child. I'm assuming you don't love one more or less because they were your adopted child versus your birth child. They're your children, right? And at the end of the day, if you're doing it right, they're your kids. Um, and so, you know, I, I certainly don't want to completely equate working on a project as a kid, obviously kids are more important, but um, that's the closest thing that I can think of to how to approach it, you know? Uh, a project that comes from me, I am passionate about because it comes from me and I love it and I want to see it flourish in the world. But even if a project doesn't come from me, I'm helping to guide it and raise it and nurture it. Um, and I love it just as much. And you have to, it's so much work and it's always a challenge. You have to find what you love in that project and be able to put your all into it yeah. um, so that it can flourish and it can grow and you can see it in the world and be proud of it. And so that's at least part of how I see the difference between maybe service jobs and jobs that originate from you or from the studio, from whole cloth. It's still, you still gotta find what you love about that project and, and nurture that. And, and 
Yeah, for sure. It's almost like something I've been thinking about because I, I almost feel like sometimes, you know, my ego takes over with, with animation because it's a creative thing and it comes from inside. Mm -hmm. And essentially the process is the same, whether you're working on your own project or somebody else's project. Uh, Absolutely. It's just like the internal feelings you get of the attachment of your own project and nobody else but you is going to feel that. Like the people watching at home aren't going to be like, oh, this is a uh, Mousse. I'm super excited because this is Mousse's versus <laughs> uh, Terry's, for instance. Right. They're just like, I like good content. I'm going to watch it if it's good. Absolutely. Um, so, but it, it's like a weird, it's like an internal drive to, I got to make my own thing. And not everybody has it. I've talked to people who are it's true. Uh, more content working on other, making other people's uh, stuff come to light. So. Absolutely. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's, yeah. you know, the, the world needs those kinds of creatives as well. And, and, you know, I think what's great about animation is you can find your niche and you can find your calling and, and just sort of lean into that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one, one question I have for you, well, maybe you can tell me how you got your first gig, but, and start off this way, but I'm just wondering, you know, what is that thing inside of you that has allowed you to progress through so many different roles over the years? You know, some people, they find that animation is their niche and they, they kind of stay within that and, and they become like the ultimate master within their field. And then, you know, other people become jack of all trades where they like to, you know, dip their hands in CG and 2D and uh, flash and motion graphics and kind of do all those things. And then, you know, there's people like yourself who kind of progress through different uh, roles within like, like I don't know if there's like a hierarchy and animation, sure. I guess, but it, it sounds like kind of what you've done from animator to lead to supervisor to now your creative director. What is, what is that thing that has allowed you to naturally progress or maybe naturally is the wrong word, you know, work really hard, learn, learn and progress, I guess. Um, maybe it's curiosity, but it, you know, it's also, I mean, I think that's probably the biggest thing, uh, wanting to learn and wanting to learn about different things and not being satisfied about, um, you know, that's a dual-edged sword, of course, yeah. um, not being satisfied about where you are and where you want to be. Did you, you have a goal when you were an animator to become a director, for instance? To be honest, I didn't, I didn't. I kind of, when I, even when I first started, even out of school, I didn't think about directing as much as like, oh, I wanted to create cartoons and animation, you know? So I, I wasn't even looking at it in terms of those, you know, that sort of industry structure. I just, I kind of wanted to make stuff. Um, and so um, the thing that I did learn, um, and it took me a little while to learn, is that um, at least in my experience, everybody's a little bit different, but um, I kept thinking when I started off, once I did realize, oh, I guess to be, to create something and to sort of be the creator and creative lead on something, you sort of director is one way to do that or a primary way to do that. Um, and so once I realized that, um, I thought that, well, I'll just be the best animator that I can be and people will see that. And then if I'll be promoted to beyond that. That's how that works, right? Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't how it worked for me. Um, and maybe it was just the timing or maybe it was the situation or the projects, but I, didn't, I felt like I, I didn't get those kinds of opportunities beyond animator until I actually let people know I wanted to do those things. And I, I sought them out. I sought out opportunities. Um, I applied for animation director jobs when I knew I probably wasn't quite qualified for them because I knew I wanted to stretch. I knew I could do them, but I maybe wasn't ready, but I at least wanted to put it in the mind of people that, um, you know, maybe not right now, but maybe you'll start thinking of me in this way. Yeah. And you're also um, putting it in your own mind too, instead of, you know, having absolutely. This wall of fear that I'm not good enough yet. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, so things started to change a little bit when I did that. And of course, you know, um, uh, people did give me opportunities. Um, you know, there's a lot of luck and, and fortune involved in, in people's careers. Certainly there was in mine. Um, 
you know, people that liked me or people that saw an opportunity or project that they thought I would be a good fit for and gave me those breaks or those opportunities. Um, but also I tried to be ready for them when they came. And again, letting people know that I wanted to do those things so that if the right project came along, that, that I would be ready for those. Gotcha. So, would yeah. it be wrong to say your strategy was to do the best you could in your current role and also to pursue opportunities beyond what your current role was so that you, know, you could figure out the expectations of what people wanted from you and also that other people could see that you were grasping for those? Um, Absolutely. I, I wish that it had been as well thought out as, as what you just said. We'll go back in time. Okay. You'll listen to this podcast and then so, you'll end up exactly where you are now. Exactly. Perfect. <laughs> so, but, okay. So, but what about producer? Because that's a totally different skill set of, you know, there's animation and creative vision, but producers like numbers and relationships and all that stuff. So how do you move from, you know, being a great animator and, and I don't know when you became a producer in your career, but how do you move to that? Uh, for me, it was, um, uh, I had rented a studio space, you know, in stop motion, you need space to work on things. And I had rented a studio space so that I could make some stuff of my own and work on my own projects. And um, a really unique opportunity uh, was brought to me. Uh, it was actually the first chance I got to solo direct projects. Um, it was a, um, a short film for Alison Sudol, um, who also uh, performs music, or at least used to perform music under the name of Fine Frenzy. And a producer that I had interned for years before, um, Marcy, um, she they wanted this project to be stop motion. She knew that I did stop motion and she reached out to me and said, would you, do you think you could do this thing? And part of, I think what won them, part of at least what won them over was I had a space. I had a space that I could do it in. Huh. And, and so that's part of how I became a producer was having a space, was asked to direct a project and then supervised, you know, most aspects of, the production from hiring the team to animating myself and hiring the animators and building out the space so that it wasn't just my, you know, it wasn't just a personal space for me to play around in, but a production friendly space that multiple people could work in and get this project done. So and you, then, sorry, so you started renting a studio just for your own mm -hmm. interest to be like, mm -hmm. I wanna make my own stuff in Stamo, so I'm gonna rent this small studio. And then mm -hmm. the opportunity came in and because of where you were renting, you had the opportunity to expand it into something larger. Yep. Uh, interesting. Yeah, not and, and not necessarily physically larger, although we did do that, right. um, but just to build out the space. It's the difference between a, you know, like a hobbyist space and then, you know, uh, a production savvy studio space. Um, and, and that project allowed me to do that get purchase more equipment and um, build, uh, you know, build things that needed to be made for the for the project. And, um, and so that was really my first stab at that I had, you know, supervised stuff at school, and I had worked with, I'd been um, animation director on projects and lead animator. So I, I knew something about supervising, but it was the first time that I had directed solo and the first time that I really had a space that was something that you know lent itself to 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 producing something and so sort of learned on the job and learned a lot from the, the other producers that were on the project and then that project led to other projects and and I had other opportunities because I had the space and then, then I had the equipment and then you know um like many things in your career, it sort of one thing leads to another. And so, um, yeah. So what you're saying is one day there will be a gigantic Musse studio <laughs> where... Uh... <laughs> well, I, you know, I, uh, you know, there are no plans for that. I still have the same studio space that, I, that I've had. And, and I split my time now that, you know, working from home, I split my time between that and uh, my apartment. Yeah. Um, but... Um, 
you know, right now I'm, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm so excited and firmly committed to, to being at six point and, yeah. and oh, I didn't, us. I didn't mean to say. <laughs> um, no, no, I mean it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just I'm, like, so it sounds like you're very entrepreneurial and, and, you know, you have this passion for animation and you've worked with so many people and, you know, you've, you've managed, managed, supervised, et cetera. I'm wondering where do you see people getting hung up in their career? You know, they're, they're bumping their head against the wall and they just can't break through. Like, what do you see as kind of the biggest thing in the animation industry where people are getting stuck from progressing in the ways they want to? That's hard. I think it, it, it's different for different people. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think, um, yeah, it's just different for different people. And sometimes people have an idea of what they want to do and they're following that then rather than realizing what they're doing is special and interesting and you can find a thing that you, you, you know, you, the birds are already in your hands, <laughs> you know, yeah. you don't. Um, so I think that is some of it, our expectations uh, of ourselves and of the industry. Um, um, that's, you know, some, that's I, something I'm learning. And I keep telling myself, if I go in with expectations, I'm going to be disappointed because like, for me, um, I only got into this industry or I started studying in this industry in 2018. And my mindset was like, I need to, to like go to school and progress as fast as I can, because I'm already later in my life and career. And so like, I need to get ahead ASAP, but I've just been learning to enjoy and get the most out of what I'm doing currently. And I mean, if I'm not enjoying the journey, why am I why am I, why am 100%, I this? 100%. It, it, so I, it really, I really, that really resonates with me about, you know, the expectations thing. Yeah. I think it's about, it is so much about expectations, but it's also, it really is about the journey and it's so cliche to say, right. But I, I <laughs> yeah. you know, like it's cliche for a reason, you know, it's, it, it, it um, if you have that joy and you have that you know, love of learning and improving right where you are, that shows through and that shines. And then people notice that. And, and hopefully people will, that will help lead to other opportunities. Um, you know, I think sometimes, I, you know, I see it, I've seen it sometimes with students or with, with interns or, you know, PAs, they're so focused on where they want to be that they don't actually take the time to be good at what they're doing right there. Yeah. Why would I hire you to be something else when you're not doing a good job of what you're doing, you know? Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I've had to um, internalize that because there've been times when I've been, you know, more focused on where I want to be than where I am. Oh yeah. And Sometimes it's easy to say like, I'll do a better job when I have the job I want absolutely. versus right now. But it's also cause there's this fear of, you know, not getting an opportunity or, or putting all yourself into a current role and getting stuck there too. Because you, like, if it's not, if you know that it's on the right path to what you want to do, but it's not the thing, like it's, it's hard to, sometimes I, I, you know, you can get in your own head about what you're doing. So yeah. it's like a balancing act. Well, for sure. I think it's, I mean, I mean, life is like, life is, is a balancing act. You know, it really <laughs> is. I, I, it almost came out of my mouth. I, I, as a joke like a box of tacos but um <laughs> but it, it's not like a box of tacos at all it really is a balancing act and finding something that you're passionate about you know i, I always caution my students of giving their all to a studio um you want to do the best job that you can but you always want to hold something protect yourself protect your inner creativity and protect your ideas and protect your essence because as much as I love working in this industry, it is an industry and it can chew you up if you're not protective yeah. and careful. And it is that balance between, you know, doing the best that you can and, and giving it your all without giving 100% of your soul, right? There's a difference between that. And, and I think making sure that you I always encourage students to, to work on their own stuff and to develop their own ideas and to, you know, I've seen so many of my peers like work on their own projects between paid projects because there's something fulfilling and wonderful about creating something, just you and your friends or just yourself. Yeah. Um, 
that feeds a different part of your creativity or your soul that as enjoyable and fulfilling as working for a larger studio or a, a larger corporation can be, and it can be, but it can also be exhausting. And, um, you know, um, it can be weary sometimes being on a long haul on something. So um, you just have to strike that balance. Sorry, it looked like you were about to say something and I kept I kept talking, so. You answered it for me, so it was, it was, <laughs> it was perfect. I guess, you know, you, you teach a lot of students over the years and, and um, I'm sure you, you've mentored people through your career and stuff. What is kind of the, I, I guess for somebody listening right now and they're thinking, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in the animation industry and I, I'm, I'd love to be a creative director or a director kind of in, in your path one day, what is like a good piece of advice that you could give them to take home like tonight and, and maybe change their mindset or work on to that would uh, open them up to that? Um, stay curious. Stay think, curious. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think you have to, you have to um, stay hungry. Is there a way to, um, inc I guess, I don't know the right word, but like increase your curiosity on the job. Like, do you, do you make sure that you go and talk to other people in different departments or do you like, how do you, you're curious on the job. How do you execute that in a way that's productive? Sure. I mean, I think it depends on the role that you're in or, or the studio that you're in. You know, I spent about 20 years in stop motion. And so now I'm essentially working for primarily a 2d animation studio. Yeah. So I don't know how everything is done. Stop, uh, uh, 2D was my first love and I'm so excited to be back doing it again. It's kind of what introduced me to the world of animation is just traditional 2D cartoon animation, right? But I don't always know how people do stuff or how people create stuff. I'm an artist, but I'm not necessarily, you know, the kind Reading of artist. Art. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so... Yeah, I stay hungry. I, I've learned so much from, um, quite frankly, from the other creative director, uh, Greg Franklin at the studio and, and his experiences and how he's handled things throughout his career. And we have, we have weekly check-ins and that's, that's really important to me. Um, but also, you know, just um, having those conversations about how do, you, um, how do you do this thing? And what is, you know, what's your favorite part of this software or um, how did you get that look or what's the brush that you used for this particular effect or certainly um, earlier in my career in stop motion, it was uh, watching other people's shots and asking them how they did it. And when they did something really cool, like, how did you do that? I don't know how to do that. You know, how did you get that timing or, or or sometimes not even asking them, just looking at the dailies and or stepping through if you have access to the to the shot on, on a computer, stepping through frame by frame to see how did they do that move. You know, I learned so much um, as an animator by just looking at cool shots that other people did. Um, but yeah, I think it's I think it's just it's staying hungry, it's staying. Um, hungry, not thirsty, but staying hungry and um, just just uh, talking to people and communicating. It, it is a community and, and um, you know, even my time in school, I learned so much. I learned a lot, obviously, from my professors, but so much from sitting and working with other students and seeing what, how they did stuff. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. and now, you know, uh, more than ever, you can reach out to other artists just on, you know, on, on Instagram or on their website and say, Hey, I'm a fan. And I, you know, I'd love to chat with you about, you know, how you, what you're doing and how I'm you do on this. my podcast. So, I want I'm to on the podcast. Brain. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly what we're doing. No, I a hundred percent agree with you. And, and, um, one of my favorite things to do is just to go through other people's animation frame by frame. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I mean, I still do that just to see like, yeah. I don't even, you know, that's, that's where the magic is because oh, yeah. when it's working well, you don't know exactly how they did it, but it, it sings on screen. And so to, to, you learn so much just by looking at, you know, whether it's classic old cartoons, Disney stuff, Warner Brothers, UPA, 
or just people that you're working with. Um, you know, be a sponge and absorb that stuff and you'll find the right opportunities to, to use it. Yeah. Um, so maybe as we're just kind of wrapping up, is there anything else that you wanted to share about your, you know, six point harness or your work or any final thoughts or anything? Yeah. Um, I mean, keep an eye out for, we've got some really exciting projects uh, coming out uh, at six point There's a lot of really cool stuff that we're doing in development. Um, uh, both working with external clients and, and internal development, which is really exciting. So, so that's very cool. Um, I'm not sure how much of that I am able to talk about, so I won't, <laughs> won't name anything specifically, but. Um, Look out for some non-specific things that are. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, um, I don't know exactly when this will, this interview will be released, but I, just personally, it's been a, it's been a heck of a heck of a year, year yeah. and a half, and I'm I'm excited. I'm hopeful and excited for the future um, of the world. Um, you know, we've got a lot of work to do, and um, just to to make sure people are safe and healthy. Um, and we've got a lot of work to do in, in terms of representing underrepresented people and voices in this industry in particular. And, and that's one of the things that I'm most excited about and, and hoping that it's not all just talk in terms of the industry and making sure that um, there are more stories that are created by and supervised by women, by, um, you know, people of color, by, um, LGBTQ uh, folks, um, you know, I think um, that's an exciting, you know, as much as I love animation and the history of animation, it doesn't have a great uh, track record in terms of diversity and inclusion. And I think um, we're now at a, at a time where people are starting to understand that a little bit more. And, and hopefully that means we'll see more projects that reflect that both yeah. with characters that we see on camera and then people behind the scenes that are creating, writing, producing, directing those things. And that's really exciting. And that's something that, that we're passionate about at Six Point as well. Um, building projects, designing projects, producing projects that are inclusive and diverse and um, and help, you know, uh, entertain and enlighten and make the world a better place, you know, and, and that's, that's really, really exciting. So yeah, no, I, I love that. And, and I, I feel like we're, we're, I mean, all those things are kind of, I, I see more stories every day on the news and, and whatnot and articles about you know, studios and shows launching that uh, represent minorities and whatnot. And I feel like we're going to look back and see this is kind of like a uh, awakening of, of, you know, the animation industry and representing yeah. everybody, basically, because we've kind of established how important it is as a, mm -hmm. a storytelling and cultural medium over the last couple of decades. And now it's, uh, now it's really coming to an age where we're representing everybody. So I'm, I'm really excited about <laughs> where it's going. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to share? Uh, no, not, not really. Okay. No, I don't know. Shout out to West Philly. I don't <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much, Muse, for coming yeah. on the chat. It's been a pleasure about, you know, hearing your journey and picking your brain and all the projects and kind of the insights that you've given. And uh, I'm really, I'm really happy we connected. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for having me on. It's been great. I'd love to come back anytime there's a Another project or another subject yeah, you want to yeah. we'll, we'll sure talk about? Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. And if, if you're listening and you want to get in touch with Muse, you can do so by following him on Instagram at Muse Brooker. Uh, you can also go to his website, is platypuspictureworks.com. And of course, I'll include Six Point Harness's website in the description of this video too. So please check those out. And thank you so much for listening. And that is all for now. Bye. Okay, bye. <laughs>